now we are all recharged after that short break uh, and we would be moving to the next session now uh, this the presenters for this next session are satish yatin from the department of humanities and social sciences iit madras and dr shrikant arun pathak and dr kirisha amir tilak both from the department of german university of mumbai uh, this session will be moderated by dr rajendra dengle from a professor uh, from jnu new delhi so i would now request dr dengle to introduce our presenters for this session yeah thank you so much uh, mihir can you hear me clearly yes wonderful yeah and thank you so much viba and meher uh, and thank you milin for summarizing it so beautifully you did it so so well so i don't need to do that but i think you know because i come from <laughs> a space a concern, as far as siddharth is hesa siddharth is concerned of a huge siddharth euphoria and then a siddharth mudish kind you know a complete fatigue you know because everyone was reading siddharth everyone was talking about siddharth in those i'm talking about the 70s anyway so uh, welcome everybody uh, to this session uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you yati uh, satish yatin who is a student in the third year at the integrated MA program in English studies at IIT Madras. Uh, he has training in history, philosophy, political science, and linguistics, and his research interests lie in the intersection between literature, popular culture, and identity. And I have been told that he is very passionate about literary studies and that he has submitted a um, a paper, if I remember correctly, uh, Milin telling me on the Rilke. So, uh, Yatin, are you there? Yeah, he's there. I think we can't hear him. Ah, there he is. Are you audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yes, you are. So I just introduced you to the August audience and uh, um, may I request you to begin with your presentations. You have 20 minutes, as you know, and then we'll have 10 minutes for uh, the questions and observations and so on. So please, yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Yatin and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's been a massive learning experience for me, uh, researching and writing my paper, uh, going through the scholarship on Siddhartha and listening uh, to such distinguished and inspiring scholars. Uh, so I sort of, the title of my paper is called The Individual and the Masses, Reading Herman Hesse's Siddhartha Through the Prism of Discontent. So uh, just to give you an idea of what I want to say, I'll just read through my abstract uh, quickly. So my abstract goes uh, as such. So this paper instead of looking at Siddhartha's path towards contentment as a defining feature of analysis, rather seeks to examine the various forms of discontent that plague him through the various eras of his enlightenment, each one definable by the aftermath of particular realizations or occurrences which surface in his journey. Throughout the novel, Hesse's Siddhartha thus moves through various social environments, encountering different people and spiritual teachings, and within the course of these experiences seems to ascend or descend to various levels of enlightened contentment. So Hesse's uh, conceptualization of discontent in his descriptions of the thoughts of Siddhartha, along with his depiction of the incompleteness found in the lives of the ordinary or the childish people, which Siddhartha finds so lacking, uh, holds the key to narratives which shape and are shaped by several ideological impulses in the real world. So initially, I wanted to uh, start my paper by talking about why it's worthwhile looking at Siddhartha through the prism of discontent. So I start off by uh, discussing that section of scholarship, which analyzes the novel solely from the point of view of a hero's journey. So there are several papers I found while going through scholarship on Siddhartha, which sort of uses Joseph Campbell's uh, 17 stages of the hero's journey to sort of talk about the different stages in Siddhartha. Uh, and my argument is that this sort of looking at uh, Siddhartha as a series of stages or a teleological unfolding towards Siddhartha's ultimate uh, contentment, it detracts uh, attention from the descriptions of discontent in the novel. And it treats discontent merely as an obstacle that is to be resolved and uh, 
sort of you move on uh, after resolving it, this sort of discontent, and then you move on towards a higher stage of enlightenment. And I also argue that this mischaracterizes the novel itself. So it's not about a mounting progression towards enlightenment, but it's a much more thus value uh, in stopping and looking at the dissatisfaction that Siddhartha experiences in projects. So I then divide the novel into parts based on different phases in, of Siddhartha's journey. So it's a divi uh, divide on the basis of certain realizations and decisions that he takes. And I also do some close reading of the, what the dissatisfaction he feels at each stage involves uh, with some description. So this would involve his initial stage before he leaves home. Uh, what is the character of the dissatisfaction that he feels towards um, the standard uh, Brahmin lifestyle of learning the Vedas and the Upanishads and what exactly is it that doesn't satisfy him and then later on in, the, in, his, uh, in his time with the Samanas and in his conversation with the Buddha and then later on in the city uh, which sort of is an allegory for materialism. So from these descriptions it's not only time to go into it but I further develop three main ideas so uh, which are all closely linked and which I'll sort of uh, come up to later. So one is the dissatisfaction with the teachings and the ways of life of the people that Siddhartha encounters. Uh, the second are the characterizations of the childish or the ordinary people uh, whose lives initially Siddhartha finds so lacking and sort of seems to uh, look on above uh, from a point of view from there. And the last is the dissatisfaction he feels with himself in his quest for authenticity. So then with regards... Uh, to sort of bring it closer to what the thrust of my paper is about, I will pose some questions with respect to the relationship between individual and society and the masses. So is Siddhartha striving towards the exceptional and his ultimate contentment? Is it dependent on some form or the other uh, of some necessary criticism of the ordinary or the childish people? Uh, so even though towards the end, Siddhartha does start to uh, identify with these ordinary childish people, uh, this is as he's looking towards a city into which his son has just disappeared. Uh, it's a sort of underemphasized passage of the book um, because it's also with such rhetoric towards the childish and uh, the ordinary people. There's also at the end of the novel, at the peak of his contentment, he is still living on the fringes of societies. Why couldn't he find that same enlightenment within uh, the city itself? So, uh, Questions like that, are the ordinary painted in negative light? Uh, so what can we deduce from this particular representation of individuality and non-conformism? So now in order to shed more light on these three main ideas, which I discussed earlier and try to answer these questions, I want to discuss Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, uh, the two major influences on Hesse and his book. So Siddhartha can be viewed as Hesse's attempt to bring together both the material and the spiritual. Uh, criticize the excesses of both and yet underscore the importance of the two in tandem. There's also a, a particular synthesis of uh, Nietzschean and Schopenhauerian ideals uh, that Hesse attempts uh, because uh, Siddhartha can ultimately be read as an ubermensch uh, who forges his own path and creates his own experience in a manner which uh, mirrors the Nietzschean way very closely. So uh, I kind of want to uh, just uh, mention a quote in Nietzsche's Untimely Meditations, which can sort of very almost succinctly summarize what Siddhartha is about, one of the main themes of Siddhartha. So Nietzsche says, nobody can build the bridge for you to walk across the river of life. No one but you yourself alone. There are to be sure countless paths and bridges and demigods which would carry you across the river, but only at the cost of yourself. You would pawn yourself and lose. Where does it lead? Don't ask, walk. So in order to go down the progress of my paper, I just want to bring up a very particular misunderstanding of Nietzsche, which is uh, the one which the Nazi parties, the way the Nazi party misinterpreted Nietzsche in order to uh, make that, uh, that romantic ideal sort of serve the ideals of the Nazi party. So one of the most famous misunderstandings is of the Ubermensch and of Nietzsche's ideas regarding the slave morality and the master morality. morality. So what they got from Nietzsche's writings was uh, that the slave morality must be transcended and there must be a return to a form of master morality, which smashed previous systems with a sort of might is right approach and uh, the follower uh, or the creator rather of this uh, morality uh, 
of this forceful self uh, self serving form of morality would be the ubermensch uh so nietzsche does not say this though he disparages the mentality of the herd he wanted uh people to transcend both the master and the slave morality and uh, to become the creator of a morality which was far more benevolent than what the nazis uh, assumed so this mischaracterization i argue that in siddhartha there is just such a place to insert this mischaracterization and sort of uh, take it along to another path which would relate to to, to modern ideology and narratives which are 100 years later uh, very different as is time so i argue that this mischaracterization is possible in the space where uh, hesse attempts to combine the ideals of both nietzsche and schopenhauer so hesse i mean uh, siddhartha towards the end uh, in his uh, state of contentment does retain a certain schopenhauerian world denial uh, in spite of his nietzschean path towards enlightenment and while not living in the middle of a community and shunning society uh the initial rhetoric of the childish people which is underscored by uh, siddhartha's initial attitude towards them and combined with this mischaracterization of nietzsche and uh initially that mindset of the hero's journey in siddhartha as a sort of uh mounting path towards progression and enlightenment this can lead to readings which view siddhartha as an ubermensch uh who has strived towards the exceptional while leaving behind uh the sheep and the herd uh in the dust even though hesse sort of uh is that's not the representation of nature that hesse uh, shows because uh like i said there is a sort of realization of siddhartha's of an identification with the childish or uh, the ordinary people so right now in today's world if you actually look up uh how siddhartha is popular um it's popular as a self help book in 2020 and if you look at lists of books that investors and entrepreneurs and big businessmen sort of suggest uh to budding businessmen and entrepreneurs siddhartha almost inevitably shows up on that list so uh so siddhartha is read as a book in which you can sort of maximize uh, your own potential and it's realized and as in sort of aspiring entrepreneur entrepreneurial class in the self help category so we need to recognize now that like uh the start of this conference is a quote by paul w morris which says uh, by the author's own admission siddhartha is a story about individuality and self expression a quintessential western tale cloaked in indian garb and punctuated with a staunch non conformity that served to cross both generations and cultures so uh questions of non conformity and individuality are very different now in 2022 as they were 100 years ago in hesse's time and for example now uh, non conformism could be being an anti vaxxer or being a flat earther or distrusting the media and science uh, so that level of non conformity also poses questions in terms of the philosophical field of authenticity and the relationship that the individual uh, needs to retain whether there's a sort of connect that needs to be retained towards the community how the community shapes the authenticity of the individual so uh, Charles Taylor's view of philosophy becomes very uh, useful in sort of interpret interpreting these questions. Um so yeah, a push to a uh, non-conform non-conformism and authenticity can thus become a far cry from the reading that we would come to uh, if we actually looked at the novel in the light of Hesse's history as an ardent critic of the Nazi regime. Uh the particular discontent that he was trying to portray uh in sort of novels like Steppenwolf that was spreading rapidly through a uh, a rapidly modernizing post war europe and other malaises that he saw in the society that he inhabited so hesse was very uh, vocally anti war and he was a rare voice uh, in a society that surrounded him which which sort of criticized him and critiqued him for his views and uh, that that's a very different kind of non conformity which uh, people tend to read uh, into siddhartha today because those those narratives have shifted in terms of non conformity and individualism so the original question of discontent over living an authentic life uh, can this prove to be an extremely valuable tool uh, in understanding our age of unprecedented individualism uh, does a requirement to work on oneself and move towards an authentic life also involve a disparagement of those around you who live inauthentically so uh, what is the required relationship that exists behind the urge to be exceptional and the community around you 
So I argue that if this mischaracterization of, of the narrative, uh, it can be used to serve the ideology of these sort of supermen uh, CEOs, these ubermensch CEOs and, and visionaries who uh, can sort of use that narrative and that ideology to sort of uh, make it a very self-serving thing in much the way um, that the initial mis misinterpretation of Nietzsche happened. Uh, so we can thus find deep narratives that can feed the ideologies of the individualist entrepreneurial class and the modern alt-right if misinterpreted and combined with the hero's journey approach, or they can serve as valuable tools to critique them. Uh, so the concerns which Hesse wrote about a century ago are still around today. And the novel, I think, is a valuable tool in understanding them and its existence as a discussion and representation of these narratives. Yeah, so that's uh, my paper. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Yatin, for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it, really. And uh, so glad that you brought in Schopenhauer and, and Nietzsche and the idea of Übermensch and the level to which Siddhartha has been reduced, you know, this Jonathan Livingston Siegel kind of a uh, um, thing. But on a serious note, of course, it's about individuation, isn't it? You know, and uh, what happens in the... Earlier, we were talking about uh, Samsar and Nirvana, you know, as the, and to, how does one transcend this dichotomy? And uh, what happens then after Nirvana? I mean, does, uh, does the person of, who has experienced Nirvana, does he come back and uh, become a teacher of a different kind at the, at the river, taking people from one banks to the bank to the other is the question. But the floor is now open. I'm sure there are questions um uh, observations the floor is open who would like to please raise your hand raju i have a question to the paper presenter yes May I ask? please please go ahead uh, thanks uh, very much uh, for uh, shifting the focus in this session uh, uh, towards uh, the question of uh, the element of uh, individual versus masses and, and the element of discontent. Because um, it's Siddhartha, essentially, if you uh, link it to uh, uh, its uh, the moment, uh, the historical moment in, in um, when it was written and uh, Hesse was living, uh, Hesse very often this uh, aspect of his resistance to a certain kind of um, rise of uh, uh, fascism and the rise of uh, a dictatorship and this whole discontent of uh, the intelligentsia, uh, European intelligentsia with uh, the industrial culture and uh, the kind of uh, conflict that was uh, being uh, created and looking eastwards uh, for solutions. I think this is a, a, an element which uh, is, is very, very important. And the later uh, reception or uh, say the appropriation of the students movement in, uh, in Europe and in America specifically, of this text as a text of resistance, I think, uh, that is, I think that is something that needs to be, I'm glad it was brought in by the speaker here, uh, the, the individual vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, Hesse's own life experience as somebody who, it is not just about religion and religiosity, but at that moment, he was very seriously totally disenchanted with what was happening, the war which had he had experienced and uh, later on the life of the text as a text in the 60s by a generation which was against the Vietnam War, which was uh, very, very vociferously and it, the appropriated Hesse and Hesse became a kind of a figure of resistance of a counterculture in, in Europe. Uh, so I think this, this is an interesting point that uh, the shift that has the speaker has brought in. Thank you, Jyoti. That's just an observation. Thank you so much, Jyoti. Yeah. Um, Mir, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Uh, first of all, I had uh, first of all thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I had a comment or an observation uh, 
when i read through the novel uh, especially when the, the when that part arises where he himself is imparting his own experiences to his friend govind uh, i thought about the same thing nietzsche's yuba men so that is one uh, one thing which i wanted to mention the, the other two questions which i have are more of what we call verständnis fragen uh first of all you uh, if i understood it understood you correctly you in, you feel that it's more about uh, siddhartha's failures right rather than the uh, epi- epiphany we ha- which he has at the end of his road uh so is that was my, that was my first question and the second question was uh, did you mean that uh, Siddhartha is not just a rebel without a cause that he is just simply rebelling for the sake of rebelling but he is trying to find his own way so those are two uh, basic verständnis fragen which i had uh, if you could shed light on them that would be really great uh, can i respond to, to that yeah, please go ahead yeah so i'm not saying that siddhartha is about the failures uh, of of siddhartha himself but i'm saying that there is a general trend to read siddhartha as a sort of step by step book on how to find your enlightenment or so in a sort of very self-help way which doesn't take into account the descriptions of discontent in themselves so uh that was what uh, your initial question was um yes with regards to the second one it's uh, i think there is a part like a sort of universal struggle it's not necessarily sort of rebel without a cause but it's uh it's a some, something of a more complex uh process of learning and i i when i read siddhartha it's ultimately a very uh the the most outstanding theme to me is the pedagogical one in terms of learning and uh sort of shaping your own experience and it's doesn't so i think i don't think there has to be a cause and that that's what uh i don't see siddhartha as a rebel without a cause yeah but uh, would you say that he's a rebel in the first place at all because he uh isn't rebelling against something he just trying to find his own path at, at least that's the feeling which i got just trying to walk the path instead of just uh reading or listening about what someone else has said about the path which is what he tells uh, tells his, his mentor uh, gautama he, uh, he whatever you say rather than what you say what you have done matters more to me and i would like to experience that first hand so would you i mean would it be right to call him a rebel in the first place um i i don't think i would see him as a rebel as such because he's not trying to uh, sort of find fault or criticize what these schools of thought are about so he's not trying to actively supersede them uh, in any way he's just he's saying okay this is not for me and he sort of moves on along his own path so in that sense i would find the word rebel not particularly suitable uh, yeah yeah i would i would agree with i would agree with you thank you thank you so much yeah alexander philips you have a question yes hi um first off thank you very much for that presentation i really liked the kind of negative framing of the novel around the issue of discontent and i also really like the uh uh way that you situate the novel in terms of a sort of intellectual history that we can trace down from Schopenhauer to Nietzsche and then all the way down to like the contemporary uh self-help book. Um and <clears throat> my question actually has to do with um I mean you talked about the politics of the Nietzschean Übermensch you talked about uh you talked about um uh Hesse's uh criticism then of the nazi regime that comes out i think more in uh, steppenwolf as i recall correctly where you know the character for instance bemoans the fact that um, that nobody really seems to want to avoid the next war but i'm wondering if i could get your thoughts a little bit more on um the politics of sidarta especially in its historical context i mean the fact that this novel appeared you know in 1922 after the experience of failed revolution during the precarity of the weimar republic and given you know i mean given the fact that um and i forgive me i'm looking at my german edition here but uh, given the fact that uh, in the dedication hermann himself does explicitly index the experience of world war 1 when he says um seit dem herbst des jahres 1914 da sie seit da die seit kurzem eingebrochene Atemnot der Geistigkeit auch mir plötzlich spürbar wurde. Right, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so in terms of uh, answering your question, uh, 
I would not see Siddhartha uh, as political of a text as, say, Steppenwolf, um, because it's more like it came at a time uh, of Hesse's very personal, like a, a time of great personal struggle for, for Hesse, as well as uh, a, a time of great political uh, crisis. Um, so I would see that the questions of discontent, um, they are a little more hazy in Siddhartha than they would be in Steppenwolf. Um, because his uh, painting of of society and sort of that that material realm in which to in which he enters is not um, like it's not overtly political. It can also be uh, dissected through the through the lenses of Indian philosophy and uh, and other uh, such perspectives. So I don't see it as overtly. It can be read as uh, very overtly political. Uh, but I think the main thrust of what my argument in terms of the politics of it was was just how the questions of non-conformity and individualism have shifted uh, from a hundred years ago to now. Uh, so that was where the main thrust of uh, the political argument was coming in. So I can't really speak as to what uh, Hess's intentions were at the time in terms of representing the, 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 you know, the wasteland of the society that he lived in uh, at the time. But I would say that there's uh, this great of, like uh, interpretive meaning and trying to uh, like, gain meaning out of like readings which through that lens as well. Okay. Any other questions? We have time for one more Mr. question. Mr. Dengue, may I just uh, ask something, please? Yes, Can you yes, see yes, me? Yes, I yes. can't see myself, so it's a little funny. I, I hope yes, I'm, I'm right. visible. Uh, if okay. you can right inside, there is a view thing. If you click on that and gallery, you get it. All right. Okay. Uh, so, Yatin, thank you so much. It was really interesting. And especially because you spoke on uh, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, something that is very close to my heart as well. And I, in fact, also have been um, thinking about the question of individuation in Siddhartha, um, you know, to get a fresh perspective. And I'm so glad that you called it a self-help. I mean, it is true. Today, it is it has that status. You know, um, we are trying to um, dig out meaning out of this book, uh, but there is something that is, um, it, it's true and I'm, I'm really uh, glad that you're so honest. Um, I would like you to also talk, when you talk about the Uber Mensch, uh, and when you talk about, um, well, uh, about the slave and uh, master morality, I would also like you to then uh, look into the Zarathustra text a little bit and talk about self-overcoming. That will, I think, also strengthen your argument. Um, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, Shruti. Yeah. So uh, self-overcoming, and especially because this is about the self, and there are a lot of um, instances in the Zarathustra text where you can then talk about um, and, and build your argument there. Um, I somehow did not think about Yuva Mensch because Yuva Mensch is for me an open end. And somehow here, Siddhartha, he kind of comes to an end, There's some kind of a conclusion because he becomes a teacher himself. And in fact, he's a very successful teacher. He's a perfect lover. He's a perfect student. Um, he, he is a very privileged guy throughout, you know, and uh, he chooses asceticism. And then he denies asceticism himself. So it is really all very, he's, it's, it's all very self-initiated. The question whether he's a rebel or not, it is all self-initiated, I feel. And he just wants to, this is kind of a flannery. You know, I just have this feeling. He's just actually just going and seeing. And, 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 and this the style nam lozi kite of a flaneur. I see that here. And it, it's very interesting. Uh, he, he is there, he learns things from Kamala. It's just the art of love. You know, he does not, uh, he does not get consumed by her love. He leaves her. He does get confused, consumed by the materialism of Kama Swami though, and he hates himself for that. And that's why he also plunges into the river. But, um, you know, somehow it is some kind of a distanced relation to uh, knowledge attainment. And this is something that I am sometimes a little irritated with. And I cannot myself, um, uh, you know, I, I cannot come to terms with this attitude, though, you know, I think this is very healthy because it is about overcoming the self and not getting fixed at one, not being dogmatic. And yet, you know, it is tricky. When does one stop? When does one know that I don't need a teacher anymore? Uh, these are certain questions that I was not able to answer myself following the Nietzschean path, for example. <laughs> but thank, thank you so much. You. It was really lovely. <laughs> 
Thank you, ma'am. I think, uh, I think you uh, please respond, and then uh, I think we'll have to because we're running out of time. Am I right, Viva? Yeah. I, yeah. Can I just add someone? Eat something, but then we should continue. Okay. Yeah, Babu. Uh, can I can I just add to that what? Uh, and then Yatin, and then we'll. Yeah, sure. sure. I, I mean, the only thing is uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, combined effect of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. You know, it's very problematic. Even the life during the life of Nietzsche, and that was the Wagner Wagner's the conflict with Wagner. We got, you have to come somehow separate Nietzsche from all this. I would say because uh, he had a very clear confrontation with the kind of uh, even with the Indian philosophy with Shankara with this uh, Schopenhauerian flavor, Schopenhauerian perspective of all this, and how the Schopenhauerian society and the Schopenhauerian uh, Nachfolger, you know, the Wagner and all. But then uh, after Nietzsche's life, it again surfaced uh, with the combined Nietzsche and Schopenhauer with Thomas Mann and many others. So, and particularly the Thomas Mann, that decadence, that, that factum of decadence, you know, the, so he, how he highlights in his works. I wonder, like uh, in Hesse's case, Again, back to this nexus of Schopenhauer and uh, Nietzsche, which I find very problematic. You know, like uh, there's a clear break, you know, from Schopenhauer to Nietzsche, and how that uh, uh, reflected in Hesse. And I think uh, Nietzsche wouldn't agree with Hesse in that. You know, <laughs> that's my understanding. Yeah, Thank you, so, Babu. yeah Yatin, please respond uh, to both yeah, the your questions and. Uh, I don't think I have uh, the required depth of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer to actually like comment on that. Uh, so that way, I think I'll, I'll be very humble and like, take that as an observation rather than a question. Uh, uh, may I respond to Babu? Uh, Babu, uh, you know what? At, at one place, Hesse himself writes that he was reading Nietzsche and then he took up Schopenhauer and somehow Schopenhauer stayed on. So that's the connection that Hesse himself makes in one of his letters. So that's the connection then. I think it won't be wrong to draw this connection. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, thank you everybody. And thank you, Yatin, for a wonderful presentation and everybody who asked questions and uh, made observations and so on and contributed to this, this discussion. So thank you so much once again. So. We We move on to the next presentation and may I invite, may I introduce uh, Dr. Srikant Pater, who doesn't need any introduction because he's a, a colleague from the Department of German in Mumbai University, assistant professor, research guide for PhD, uh, uh, did his PhD from the University of Echta in Germany in the field of metafiction, hyper-reality and stylistic imitation in contemporary German literature, completed his MA and MPhil in German from the University of Pune. He has taught German language, contemporary German literature and technical and literary translation at the bachelor's and master's level, etc, etc, etc. Lots of things to say about uh, Shrikan. Currently, he is involved in translating a renowned German novel into mystery. Uh, into Marathi. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a mystery which novel it is. But I'm, I'm told that he's now going to talk about uh, the reception of Siddhartha in, in Marathi, the different versions that he has come across. And I really look forward to, we all look forward to your presentation. Shrikant, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Dengre, for your kind words. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. So the, I would be now taking uh, all of us to a different plane from Nietzsche and Schopenhauer to basically to the realm of translation. Uh, so the topic is uh, Siddhartha, an Indian novel in translation, contemporary Marathi versions of Hermann Hesse's novel. Uh, yeah, thank you, Juhi, for presenting uh, the PowerPoint. The presence of our uh, pre the presence of four Marathi translations of Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha in the market only underlines the interest of the Marathi readers in this philosophical novel. However, it would create the following doubt in the minds of any student of translation: How can there be four translations 
coexisting peacefully at the same time. Among all the four versions, the Bhavanuvad by Trambak Vinayak uh, Sardeshmukh can be considered as the oldest one. According to the translator's note, Sardeshmukh read the novel in English and as it was serially published in the Illustrated Weekly of India and started translating the novel into Marathi in the 1950-51. Uh, in the year 1950-51. The note also mentions that he did this to cope better with the personal crisis of a personal, uh, a crisis of a personal nature. This version was published only in 2003, that is about 50 years after it was translated. A translator's note is missing in the version by Dr. Kamlesh Soman and Srinivas Ramchandra Vaidya. Uh, Hereafter, I would only call it as Soman's version uh, that was published in the year 2016. Uh, Avinash Tadfare's Anuvad was published by uh, Herman Hesse Society of India in the year 2017. The text has been translated from English from the Gutenberg edition translated by Gunter Olesh and others. Ulka Raut's Anuvad, published in the year 2021, can be considered as the most recent one in the list. As a translator's note is missing in Raut's version, only the following information could be gathered. Uh, it has been translated from the English version provided by the publisher. It, it would be immaterial to directly compare the translations with the German text. Uh, as there are intermediary uh, English versions between the Marathi text and what we, we could call the proto-original German text. Hence, uh, although close reading is applied in this paper, there is no close comparison with the original. Uh, though we would go back to the original uh, occasionally uh, to discuss certain things. Uh, as all four uh, translations are translations from similar text, it is also not possible to avoid the feeling that the newer three texts borrow certain items from the older text, uh, older version. However, there is no way to substantiate this and that approach will also be avoided in the paper. All four Marathi versions have an image of Gautam Buddha on the cover page, as you may have already seen. Although Siddhartha, the main character of the novel, and Gautam Buddha, the enlightened one, are two distinct characters, and Buddha is present in the novel as a character uh, in one of the chapters. Now, we have seen certain other perspectives today, so uh, obviously one can even see the novel and Siddhartha and Gautam Buddha uh, from a different perspective. Uh, but what, uh, what it can also be attributed to is creative marketing by the publishers, or it can be seen as an interpretation that Siddhartha and his journey symbolize the path that needs to be taken to attain enlightenment, or we have seen a contra perspective today uh, already in the paper, uh, in a previous paper. One sees noticeable differences in the versions from the very first chapter, their zone, this Brahmanam. It is almost as if there are different Siddharthas in various versions. The discontent in Siddhartha's mind is initially not intense in Soman's version. Siddhartha, uh, quote, Siddhartha Matra Swatacha Ayusha Badal Farsa Samadhani Nauta. In comparison with Raut's version, where he was never at ease in his mind. He was sad and discontented inside. Quote, Siddhartha Ananda Vatnara uh, Manumani Dukhi Hota. And Panto Manatun Kayam Aswastha Saiza. The discontent in Siddhartha's mind in Tadfare's version is accompanied with, the dis, uh, with disinterest and unhappiness. Quote, Panto Swata Matra Atyata Aswastha Hota. Ache Man Kashatas Lagat Nase. Sardeshmukh's version is more poetic in its description. Siddhartha Swataha Sukhala Parkha Hota. The feeling of not being satiated and dissatisfaction in his mind are compared with weeds that have taken roots at an unwanted place. Uh, quote, Atruptichi 
व असमाधानाची बीज आपल्यात मूळ धरून राहिली आहेत याची सिद्धार्थाला जाणीव होऊ लागली फोर्थ कम्प्लीट Similarly, the concept of Atman, which is present in Rauts and Tadfaye's version, has been replaced with Atma uh, in Soman's text. The readers can connect Atma to later to Mahatma in in Soman's text, referring to one who is enlightened with knowledge. Tadfaye's text also uses the word Mahatma to refer to what Siddhartha's parents want him to become, and then later the word uh, refers to Gautam Buddha. Sir Deshmukh's text does not talk about Atman; rather, it interprets it as Paramatma. Uh, minor departures from the original. Uh, at this point, I would not get too much into uh, the philosophical uh, concepts because uh, probably there are experts uh, who have already uh, discussed some things, uh, and uh, it would be maybe out of place or. i would be venturing into an unknown domain when i do that uh, so i would rather stick to the translation related aspects uh, minor departures from the original may be the translator's interpretations or variations in the source text example the samanas who are referred to as sanyasi in rauts version uh, shraman sarva parityag kelele sanyasi are naked vastrahin deh and their faces look angry ragit in sardeshmukh's version they are called shramana and they are being bhatke bairagi likewise they are naked slim resembling emaciated wolves wolves and have wounds on their shoulders uh, nagna pray sadi manavi srushtitle rodavlele kollets whereas in soman's version they are called sadhus and sadhaka and also described as pilgrims or tirthayatri clothed with the bare minimum lajja rakshana purtis vastra tadfaye's version initially explains in a footnote that saman is not a distortion of the marathi word shraman but a word from pali language used here the text explains that they are sadhus of the saman community on pilgrimage and the samanas uh, in tadfaye's version are adorned with loin cloths langot siddhartha's decision to go and stay with the samana is crucial to the plot he seeks permission from his father in rauts version he tells his father that he is sure his father would not oppose him मी संन्यासी होण्याचे निर्णय घेतला होण्याचा निर्णय घेतला असून आपण विरोध करणार नाही अशी मला खात्री आहे दिस इज इन कॉन्ट्रास्ट टू सोमन सिद्धार्थ ओव्हर्ट रिक्वेस्ट फॉर परमिशन कृपा करून तुम्ही मला अनुमती द्या इन ताटफळे वर्जन सिद्धार्थ अँटिसिपेट्स दॅट ही वुड बी स्टॉप अँड सो ही रिक्वेस्ट हिज फादर नॉट टू स्टॉप हेम कृपा करून मला थांबवू नका in sardesh mukh's version he has come to inform his father of the decision and to find out whether he would object to it so he seeks a kind of no objection he tumche he tumcha kani ghalav mhanun alo tumcha virodh nahi na thus four different siddharthas are created by the respective narrators in the novel in the novels through differences in their states of mind choice of words actions and perspectives the third person narrators in the respective versions also take the readers linguistic ability uh, into consideration while narrating for example shloka from upanishads are given in sanskrit in sardeshmukh's version without much explanation this is the version which was written much prior to the other three versions assuming the reader would know and would be well versed with sanskrit and be aware of these shlokas Tadfaye's narrator explains the meaning of the shlok in Marathi without actually quoting the shlok thus in a nuanced manner acknowledging that they are in a different language yet anticipating that the readers would hardly have any knowledge of Sanskrit whereas Rauts and Soman's narrators give us the shlok directly in Marathi so they disregard the case that the shlok are not originally in Marathi 
not only does sar deshmukh's version presuppose the knowledge of sanskrit from the readers uh, certain words are used which may be considered as very specific cultural practices example when siddhartha's father is going for a holy bath in the morning he says maji nadi var sandhe sathi janyachi vel jhali ahe it is time to go to the river to perform sandhya thus referring to sandhya the practice of morning and evening adorations performed after the holy bath similarly one finds several words in the text that do exist in marathi but are rarely used in today's prose for example manisha anavrat uh, uh, sorry uh, avnat drushti tapasi tarun uday pavla aniket the usage of such words is limited today to names of people some other articles and concepts used here are also no longer used given that uh, giving the text a sense of belonging to antiquity this includes pieces of clothing like dhotar and uparna jewelry like kankana modes of travel like mena and the word dravya used for money another striking difference from the other three versions is the use of formal you to me by kamala while addressing siddhartha and the informal you by siddhartha while addressing kamala throughout the chapter this may be a custom in the 1950s when the text was translated uh, translated in the german version both use the informal du from their first very first interaction the characters uh, so this was uh, something about sardesh pooks version the characters in soman's version are very verbal even their emotions and thoughts are out into words and the in the text when the father grants him permission for example the father's thoughts after coming to know his son's decision to go and stay with the samanas are overtly present in the text quote काय करू मी या वेड्या मुलाला मी कसे समजावू कोट कम्प्लीट द फादर वंडर्स वॉट ही शुड डू अँड हाऊ ही शुड कन्व्हिन्स दिस क्रेझी यंग मॅन इवन वेन द फादर ऍक्सेप्ट द डिसिजन अँड डिसाइड टू ग्रँड परमिशन टू सिद्धार्थ अ लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स आर चेंज बाय हिम लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स आर सेट बाय हिम कोट ठीक आहे तुझा निर्णय जसा असेल तसा असेल अर्थात मी तुला अनुमती देखून देणार जन्माच्या वेळीच नाळ तुटली होती पण ती आमच्या परीने जपली होती हे धागे तोडून तू आपल्या प्रवासाला निघतो आहेस बेटा हा आत्मशोधाचा प्रवास खूप खडतर आहे कोट कम्प्लीट इट्स ओके इट्स युअर डिसिजन हु एम आय टू ग्रँड यू परमिशन अँड सो ऑन दिस मोनोलॉग बाय द फादर एक्सटेंड टू ऑलमोस्ट अ पेज this gives an impression of an immature siddhartha with a father who already knows what would come quote khare tar tujha shodhat challa ahes te tujha javal at ahe pan te shodhayla matra tu ghara bahar padat ahes ek gosht tari ek gosht khari ki yatunach tula sudhnata yenar ahe ani paripakvata ahe quote complete he tells him at the outset that what he is looking for is already with him uh, and that he would be wiser and more mature through this exercise the translators uh, in my opinion are being unfair to siddhartha if all this is an addition on their part the father further instructs the son on how and what he should learn and asks him to seek blessings ashirwad of his mother and he informs siddhartha that he has already blessed him tears well up uh, in soman's version tears well up in siddhartha's eyes on listening to all what what is said and the father is also holding back tears the adieu bid by the mother is likewise teary eyed giving the whole read a rather dubious trivial tone uh, in my subjective opinion uh, in the literary translation it is not prudent to give away what one knows as a translator things should unfold for the reader in the same way as they unfold in the source text in a manner similar to telling a joke 
in which the punch line may get punctured if one divulges some information at the wrong moment one must not give away in a literary translation what needs to unravel over a course of over the course of narration shrikant it, may i may yeah. shrikant may i interrupt you just uh, yes. slowly begin to wrap up yes yes definitely uh in my opinion not only does soman's version expose too much at the wrong moments through interpretative styles of narration but it also loses its serious tones by using unnecessary dialogues for such interpretation uh there are a further some more passages which i would skip because we are uh, falling short of time but this melodrama continues in the novel uh, and uh, siddharth uh, there is a point where govinda is uh, crying or somebody else is crying and soman's version loses its authenticity as the style of language is not fitting to the narrative uh, narrated time so there is also an instance where uh, uh, gautam buddha and his remarks do not sound very authentic uh, the interjection are used by the enlightened one here is problematic in my opinion uh, the style used is colloquial spoken marathi of the contemporary times uh, so the various interjections and modal particles used lighter give a lighter tone to the text so on the one hand one might identify with the characters but due to this change in parole but on the other it gives a sense of inauthenticity to the text uh one can also see the same in the concept of entzelps too uh, so different versions have different ways of how they deal with this concept uh, also the bird uh, is an egret in the three versions whereas in sar deshmukh's version we have crouch pakshi uh, which which could be a flamingo swan or a crane uh, the way gautam buddha is referred to is also very different so that can also be compared here and uh, at some point uh, there is also a very creative uh, with a uh, bhet dene which can mean to visit somebody or to present something to someone uh, the last point which i would like to mention here is the musical rhythm in the german original text the beginning of the novel is an example of this the musicality is achieved by making longer sentences giving additional information in apposition and which is roughly of equal length and certain words and phrases are repeated so uh, besides that uh, there is an aesthetic appeal to the uh, to such repetition and a musicality uh, the marathi version uh, versions do not have this musicality and one of the reasons could be that it is a retranslation that is translation of english uh, versions into marathi so that musicality has been lost so coming to the conclusion uh, last minute uh, sar deshmukh's version which comes into being in the 1950s offers a sense of distance of presenting the exotic the unknown which the readers can unravel some of this is due to the difference in its parlance however it alienates today's readers with its sanskrit shlok and the lack of explanation for words that are unknown today ulka rao's version and avinash tatpare's version strike a balance through their parole the words uh, are just exotic and familiar enough to retain the interest of the readers exotic in quotes both these texts do not reveal more than what is needed making it a process of discovery for the readers lastly soman's version can be seen as an interpretation of the novel rather than the translation due to presence of many additional passages dialogues uh, due to the colloquial style of communication of the characters uh, to conclude i would say four different versions of siddhartha can coexist because of the interpretative nature of the philosophical material in the novel the novel is siddhartha's journey each one of these novels takes the readers on a journey each journey being distinct from each other thank you
Thank you so much, uh, Shrikant, for your very interesting presentation. I was not aware that Trevi Sardesh book, of course, you know, and you seem to uh, say that, you know, um, Sardesh book's translation is perhaps, quote unquote, the best. Am yes, I right? definitely, in a way, but there are certain things which, uh, with respect to today's time, I mean, uh, every Marathi reader may not know enough Sanskrit uh, or any Sanskrit at all for that matter uh, and may not uh, understand what is given in the shloka. So in that sense, there are certain things which have become, uh, I would not say outdated, but which have become unknown uh, in, uh, in 50 years. Yeah, thank you so much. So the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions, suggestions, observations? Yeah, Viva, please go ahead. I, I think Professor Annakuti wanted to say something. Professor maybe. Annakuti, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Annakuti, good to see you. Yeah, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy that uh, Atak, our colleague Katak has brought this analysis of uh, various uh, translations in the same language. I'm very glad about it. I would even propose to uh, my colleague Viva Surana and uh, Meher, let's have a follow-up of Siddhartha 100 years by conducting, a, let's say, a workshop on translations. And perhaps we could even think of translating from the original, comparing the other versions. I think it, if it is possible, it's my humble proposal. Thank you so much. You have done it so well, because I am also referring to this reception in my panel. That is why. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Kutti. Thank you. Seeing you all. <laughs> Uh, if I may uh, mention, I think one of the translators, uh, at least he was going to be present, uh, Mr. Avinash Tadfare. Okay. I'm not sure whether he's there. I... He was going to attend the session. Yeah, Viva. Yeah, you. hi. Um, shall I introduce uh, the speaker? Uh, just a second. I just, if we have just to, I just briefly, if you could tell us, uh, you said that one of the texts uses uh, Sanskrit a lot and it presupposes that the reader knows Sanskrit. So in what manner, if you can just give one example and that's all. Uh, like there are shloka from Upanishad, which come uh, without any explanation of what that shloka is or any direct translation. So that is how then one should know what that shloka is uh, to read it in Mara uh, read the novel in Marathi. Uh, so there, I think in today's times, uh, if one doesn't know Sanskrit, it would be like a block uh, where one doesn't understand anything. And the other novels deal with it in a different manner. So one of the novels uh, says that the shloka means the following and then tells the meaning in Marathi. So there it is assuming that uh, the shloka is in uh, Sanskrit, but you wouldn't know as a reader, maybe uh, the Sanskrit uh, shloka. So directly the narrator is telling us the uh, meaning in Marathi. That is in Tadfari's version. And the other two versions, it is just the directly the Marathi uh, uh, text as the shloka. So there is a difference in that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just one thing, because I think we still have maybe half a minute. Uh, you were saying about the translator's preface, you know, uh, is there anything interesting in that, the position of the translator as uh, uh, towards Siddhartha and, and Hesse, how they understand? As students uh, of literature, we would like to know that, no? Yeah, I, two of the versions don't have any uh, translator's note. So that is a little bit sad that it's it's a translation, but the translator's note is missing. In fact, one of the covers doesn't even mention the names of the translator. Uh, the cover doesn't. It is in, uh, on the inside. Uh, so that I feel a little sad. 
but then uh, Sir Deshmukh and uh, Tadfare's uh, versions have a translator's note. But it doesn't get too much into the process of translation, uh, ex except the interesting fact in Sardesh which I already mentioned, that he was going through some personal uh, crisis, and that is where he started translating this novel to deal with the crisis. And there is some uh, similarity with um, Herman Hesse. Well, thank you so much. So we come to the, um, to the end of this part of the session. And thank you so much. Back to you, Vibha. Uh, I would like to uh, intervene here. Uh, the presentation by Dr. Grisha Tirak, which would now follow, will also be moderated and commented by Deepa Gelod who is a film critic, columnist, uh, editor, blogger, author, and curator, and who has written herself uh, ex extensively on cinema, theater, arts, women's issues, uh, and has several publications to her credit. Uh, she has also co-authored the book, The Prithvi Walas, along with the noted actor Shashi Kapoor, who has played the role of Siddhartha in the film adaptation directed by Conrad Rooks. So, uh, Grisha, over to you. May I introduce uh, Grisha first before she starts speaking? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Grisha Ameya Tilak is the assistant professor uh, at the Department of German, University of Mumbai. Her areas of specialization are European cultural history, German literature and didactics and film studies. Her topic for PhD has been German and Marathi. Uh, I think the, I don't get the German word, but I think the poetry uh, comparison of the, of the spiritual or, or religious poetry of Salishis and Tukaram, and which has also been published. And she has been actively involved in the Marathi language teaching project and has been has contributed to the publications for the same. And she has been awarded. And now this prize, uh, Girisha, you'll have to say because I can't pronounce the German term. And you will be talking about Siddhartha in, in book and film, which I think is a very exciting thing to talk about mainly because of the controversy that was created when the, when the book and the film particularly came out. Over to you. Thank you, Deepa, ma'am. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, I would not go into details of the prize right now. Maybe I would start with my paper. And uh, my paper today is Siddhartha's portrayal in book and film. I will be presenting my screen. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So, let's start. Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, this book has inspired generations of readers, writers, thinkers, as well as filmmaker Conrad Rook. It is a story of a wealthy Indian Brahmin who gives up a life of privilege to seek spiritual fulfillment. It illustrates a sense of oneness and journey through body, mind, and spirit. The paper aims to analyze this narrative by Hermann Hesse in his book Siddhartha and by Conrad Brooks in his film Siddhartha. The focus is on analyzing the three plots of the narrative. Of course, there are many instances which one can analyze in the film. I have selected the ones which narrate the plot. So, the first three chapters describe Siddhartha's experiences in the land of spirit and ends with the interlude Awakening in which Siddhartha is awakened with the idea that he is spiritually unattached and must seek a new path. In Siddhartha, this call is internal. Something inside Siddhartha is telling him that his current mode of existence is unacceptable and that spiritual awakening needs to be found elsewhere, outside his hometown. Hermann Hesse narrates this conversation of Siddhartha seeking permission from his father, wherein the father makes Siddhartha aware of how things could be and Siddhartha is steadfast about his belief and wants to go on his journey. Hence in the book, he replies with affirmative sentences. I quote, Siddhartha, he spoke. What are you waiting for? You know that. Will you always stand that way and wait until it becomes morning, noon and evening? I will stand and wait. You will become tired, Siddhartha. 
I will become tired. You will fall asleep, Siddhartha. I will not fall asleep. You will die, Siddhartha. I will die. Now I would like to present the scene from the film itself. Is my screen visible with the film shot? Yes. Yes, we can see the clip. Now? Uh, will you go on standing day and night waiting for my permission? I will stand and wait. You will grow tired, Siddhartha. Will I grow tired? You will fall asleep. Will I fall asleep? Do you want to die? Do I want to die? Was it audible now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So in film, on the other hand, the conversation is simple and precise. The short river shot depicts Siddhartha's introspection. Here, his father is making him aware of the situation and Siddhartha is aware of what his actual call is, but is shown to be contemplating. So he is asking questions, will I die or will I become tired? So it is not, I will become tired. So in my opinion, the character of Siddhartha has more clarity in the book than in the film. Later on in the book, Siddhartha walks away from Govinda. He realizes that he is embarking on a new stage of life. He has walked away from all his teachers, even Buddha, because they cannot teach the nature of self. Siddhartha decides to learn from himself alone. I quote, How deaf and stupid have I been? He thought, walking swiftly along. When someone reads the text, wants to discover its meaning, he will not scorn the symbols and letters and call them deception, coincidence and worthless help. But he will read them. He will study and love them letter by letter. But I, who wanted to read the book of the world, and the book of my own being, I have, for the sake of meaning, I had anticipated before I read, scorned the symbols and letters, I called the visible world a deception, called my eyes and my tongue coincidental and worthless forms without substance. No, this is over. I have awakened. I have indeed awakened and have not been born before this very day. I would like to present the same. I missed the sign. I thought the world of appearances was the truth. But I was wrong. It's my own eyes and my own mouth that I could not understand. I could not understand myself. Anyway, that's all over. I've awakened. I'm awake. I've been born today. Okay. In the film, the steady camera shows Siddhartha walking towards the water and then shifting the focus on Siddhartha to show his realization. This awakening is shown from the camera perspective of bottom view from behind. The immediate song selection of Bengali song Pathir Klanti Bhule by Heman Kumar Mukhopadhyay sets the awakening tone to peace and happiness. The thoughts which are worded by Hesser are conveyed in an equally powerful way by camera, especially the awakening shot. As he walks, Siddhartha sees his surroundings as real and beautiful, rather than an illusion that causes suffering. For the first time, Siddhartha is experiencing the world on its own terms, rather than scorning what it has to teach him. This is his awakening. In the next three chapters, Siddhartha experiences the land of senses and of corporal pleasure. Siddhartha lives a life of deprivation with the samanas and then lives a life of material and sexual pleasure. This second group of chapters is followed by interlude by the river, which serves to consolidate the experiences just past and prepare Siddhartha for those to come. The next instance, which I would like to present, where Siddhartha makes Kamaswami realize his mistakes. I quote, would you please not kid me with such jokes? What I have learned from you is how much a basket of fish costs and how much interest may be charged on loaned money. These are your areas of expertise. I haven't learned to think from you. My dear Kamaswami, you ought to be the one seeking to learn from me. I present the scene from the film. Everything. Please, my friend, don't make jokes like that. I have learned from you how much a basket of fish costs 
how much one can claim for lending monies. That is the extent of your knowledge, Kamaswani. But I did not learn how to sing from you. It is better if you learn that from me. For this shot, the filmmaker has selected the meal time for Kamaswami to vent out his frustration on Siddhartha that he has learned everything from him and in return, Siddhartha replies sternly that Kamaswami should instead learn thinking from him. The shot begins with the camera tilting up from Kamaswami's back and Siddhartha is visible having a meal. In this reaction shot, Kamaswami's realization of truth can be noticed. The expression in his eyes changes from anger to guilt. The scene is really well directed and has a similar effect to what reader senses while reading the book. Further selection of the scene is where Kamala and Siddhartha are talking about love. I quote, it might very well be so, Siddhartha said shyly. I am like you. You also do not love. How else could you practice love as a craft? Perhaps people of our kind can't love. The childlike people can. That's their secret. I would present the same scene from the film. You love no one. Isn't that the truth? You cannot love either. Otherwise, how could you practice love as an art? No, Kamala. We cannot love. Ordinary people can. That's their secret. The scene zooms out from the top view to show the couple in bed where they are talking about love. They notice that they share this special bond up and down of life. They can never truly love each other the way other people do. The scene becomes impactful when camera cuts to close up of Kamala. Lastly, for this section of plot, the scene selected is Siddhartha trying to drown himself. I quote, Cheerfully, he looked into the Russian river never before he had like, should it be light or felt water, so well as this one. Never before he had perceived the voice and the parable of the moving water thus strongly and beautifully. It seemed to him as if the river had something special to tell him, something he did not know yet, which was still awaiting him. In this river, Siddhartha had intended to drown himself. In it, the old, tired, desperate Siddhartha had drowned today. But the new Siddhartha felt a deep love for this rushing water and decided for himself not to leave it very soon. I would like to present the scene. mentions the positive perspective of Siddhartha looking at the river and learning from it. In the film, no cheerfulness is visible in the scene. Instead, he feels sick of his life and wants to get out of the cage. He removes his ornaments and he does not feel any positivity. I see it only as the old, desperate Siddhartha letting himself drown. Also, when he is seen alive in the next scene on the banks of the river, the serenity or the peace is not visible in the white. This is the next scene.
the final three chapters are concerned with working towards a synthesis of spiritual and the sensual, which is achieved in the final chapter Om. Siddhartha is completed with a final chapter which illustrates the totality of Siddhartha's accrued thinking and experiences. I have selected here the scene where the text narrates about Siddhartha if he has asked. If he has achieved peace, I quote, You have achieved it, she asked. You have found peace. He smiled and placed his hand on hers. I'm seeing it, she said. I'm seeing it. I too will find peace. You have found it, Siddhartha spoke in a whisper. Kamala never stopped looking into his eyes. She thought about her pilgrimage to Gautama, which wanted to take in order to see the face of the perfected one, to breathe his peace. And she thought that she had now found him in his place and that it was good, just as good as if she had seen the other one. The same scene from the film. Have you, have you attained it? Have you found peace? narrates Kamala asking Siddhartha if he has achieved peace and he tells her just before her last breath that she has found it. In the film, on the other hand, the short river shot that makes the conversation between the two and Siddhartha tells her she has found peace immediately after she passes away. The viewer gets the impression that Kamala has found peace after death, whereas in book it suggests that she has already found it and Siddhartha wants her to be aware of the faith. I move to my last instance and I quote, Do you hear? Vasudeva's gaze asked again. Brightly, Vasudeva's smile was shining, floating radiantly over all the wrinkles of his old face as the Om was floating in the air over all the voices of the river. Brightly, his smile was shining when he looked at his friend and brightly, the same smile was now starting to shine on Siddhartha's face as well. His wound was blossomed, his suffering was shining, his self had flown into oneness. I will share the seed. Siddhartha, we have traveled a long way on this river. I am old now. I can't work anymore. Now it's time for me to go. But we will meet again, and remember, nothing remains the same, everything changes, and everything returns. कुल भिंगी ओ कुल तुमी गोड़ो जारे कुल कुल दुकुल गैलो तार लगी की करो हमारे भाव छो मिठे पोर तुम्हारे नाइ की अबोशा हमारे भाव छो मिठे पोर तुम्हारे नाइ की अबोशा शुभ दुख खेर कोठा किचु कोई लेना है आमरे बोलो कोठा है तुम्हारे देश तुम्हारे नहीं की चालार शीश 
In the novel version, one can read that Siddhartha now understands childlike people because he has learned what love is, knows how it feels when tormented by love, especially for his son. He describes all his thoughts and sorrows to his friend Vasudeva. Then they meditate by river and listen to the river. They hear all the voices that together form Om. Vasudeva then shares that it is time for him to go. On the contrary, in the film, one can see that both friends ferry people across the river for some time. The, then Vasudeva goes away. Siddhartha then sees images from the past of his father, Kamala, and his son dissolve in the ripples of the river. In this situation, one can see that in the book, both friends talk more, their relationship appears to be solid than in the film. I conclude, Hesse also con consciously employs certain mechanisms of style to exemplify Siddhartha's inner state throughout the novel. He uses a characteristic triple rhythm. Each of the three stages of Siddhartha's life, reflective of the three realms of experiences, comprise an endless series of three beat actional patterns. This paper has tried to focus on these aspects and analyze in film and book by selecting these few instances from both. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tilak. Um, a, a lot of people here, at least the younger ones, may not have uh, seen the film in its entirety and probably wouldn't remember uh, what a controversy it had created when it had uh, had, had released, mainly because of Simi's um, the top, top the scene, which was heavily censored, obviously. And then there was a court case and the film was banned. And uh, But the, the photograph had become a kind of a poster for Indian eroticism, which was completely off track as far as the book is concerned. Uh, Dr. Tillard, do you think that, uh, th that the film uh, was was made for the Western Western eye, and because most Indian critics and uh, for the book and for the film seem to have found it too uh, too cliched or too lightweight or too um, exotic. You think it was it was not meant for an Indian reader or Indian audience? I would say that it is meant for the Western audience, but the Indian perspective or the Indian counterpart, the audience, they can surely relate themselves because of course because of the casting and uh, the the locations and everything so beautiful rivers scene they can identify themselves with the music which is used in the film and uh, of course because of having siddhartha gautam buddha's history they can surely see but as the book does not clearly narrate anything related to gautam buddha as such barring one chapter so the tone or the pace at which the film is made, it is in comparison to what films were made in 70s, a bit slower. So I would agree saying that it is for the Western audiences, but Indians can surely identify themselves with. With the film, yes, I mean, beautifully shot. Swin uh, Nyquist, who's Igmar Bergman's cameraman, I shot the film. And, um, and in retrospect, I'm surprised that uh, Condor Rooks got permission to shoot in Vishikesh and all that because it's so difficult to get permission to shoot in India. And a lot of filmmakers just went away to Sri Lanka or something because they couldn't deal with Indian bureaucracy. I'm talking in terms of the, the spiritualism and the philosophy that the book and the film talk about. Do you think Indians found it uh, that, okay, we are familiar with this. What are you telling us? What are you teaching us? I guess when anything of our philosophy is being read or discussed anytime, most of us would feel, oh, we already know about this. What is new in it? So yes, when the Westerners talk about it after reading something or being influenced by the philosophy, for them, it is new. For us, we know it already, but we can surely accept the format in which it is portrayed to us. Uh, I've been reading a bit about uh, the ordinary people. I mean, just readers and uh, viewers, uh, uh, you know, uh, experience of of the film and the book. And a lot of them have a strange reasons compared it to Paulo Coelho, the alchemist. So hmm. do you think that because, I mean, I, I find the Paulo Coelho, the alchemist, a very simple uh, parable of a boy's search for himself, which is pretty much what uh, is Siddhartha is about. 
So do you think that the Siddhartha also sim oversimplified uh, the spiritual search? He does because even the commoners or common people should be able to understand what the quest is about and should be able to identify with Siddhartha that we could also possibly do what Siddhartha is doing and he is not going somewhere else into many years of meditation and attaining enlightenment. He is actually living his life feeling and suffering through different stages and attaining what he is from river. So, of course, the common people can know and understand what he is doing and probably they themselves can also do it. I would uh, just like to bring in one more tiny perspective of how people could associate Siddhartha. It may not be intentional in this way, but I found the similarity between Wake Up Sid of today's time by Ayam Mukherjee and that Siddhartha and this Siddhartha who leave, live their houses and find something for themselves. That could be compared sometime later, maybe not now, but sometime later, the similar thoughts could be compared there the common people can identify themselves with the character of the book or the film. Do you think it was also has any similarity with the Chitralekha? Bhagwati Charan Sharma's uh, book also about uh, people's, you know, this, uh, what they call sannyas and experience, like bhog, you know, that, uh, the, the dichotomy that he talks about. Do you think it's uh, also comparable to that? Uh, I'm sorry, I've not said it. Ah, okay, you might have made the right position for mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, we have four more minutes to go. So, if I'd like to throw the floor open, so to say, to anyone else who might have questions. I have two questions. One is more of a question out of curiosity, and one is actually both of them are more questions out of curiosity, actually. Uh, I guess the songs which were playing in the background, if I could identify it correctly, the language was Bangla, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, any particular reason why that language is chosen? Uh, do as, do the places which are described uh, can be map can be can we map them onto uh, West Bengal or why why Bangla? And uh, secondly, uh, as in it kind of connects to what Shrikant presented uh, a few minutes ago, where he said that the four different translations look like four different Siddharthas. Does the movie Siddhartha? Uh, look in any way like the book Siddhartha because the select scenes which you showed, uh, they gave me a completely different uh, image of Siddhartha uh, from what I have from the book. Uh, where in the book he's shown to be calm, composed, you know, uh, completely uh, immersed in himself uh, in a meditative way. Here he seemed to be more of a worldly man. So these are these two questions which I had out of curiosity. Uh, it would be great if you could shed some light on them. Uh, the, the, the songs or the music which is used in this is adapted, I mean, taken from, uh, uh, they are Bangla songs and uh, they are basically taken one because the filmmaker found it apt to be used in those particular places. The permission was uh, possible for these songs. They got the permission, so they were used. This is as per my reading. There could be many further reasons. This is what I have read in one of the research papers and by researching for the uh, film and the background. Secondly, the question was if Siddhartha is different in film and if Siddhartha is different in book, I perceived him to be different in film in particular few shots, a few scenes, where in book as he knows what he wants to do, in film, he is manipulating at times, I feel, and he is contemplating whether or not, but he still has those thoughts, but maybe uh, expression-wise or uh, the narration-wise, it is understood that he has some trouble coming to the final decision. I, if I may just uh, add a little bit to that, uh, Mehir, I think it also, the, the appearance could also be because Shashi Kapoor was a little older than the character in the book. He grows okay. older through the film, but when he begins, he's not as young as the character in the book. I think that may have made a bit of a difference also. Okay. And he doesn't portray the kind of innocence that a younger man would have. 
and about the music i'll say because he was a western filmmaker and the made the film was made mainly for a western audience they wouldn't make out the difference between like a hindi song or a bengali song for them is indian you know so i think that could have been a reason also anyone else has a question yeah, i think please go yeah hi may i go yes please Hi, Grisha. Uh, uh, it was really interesting. You know, I watched both the movie and read the book. And um, so there are a couple, two things uh, that came uh, to my mind while I was listening to you. First question is, um, was it considered to be an art film? Because now we're talking about the 70s, the Indian film industry. And this is a time when, if you made, they, they still had this bifurcation, uh, this differentiation between mainstream and art. And how did it, it fit? It was an the Indian film, Shruti. It wasn't an Indian film. It wasn't not at all. So it did not even have to fare well at the box office. No. <laughs> so that never happened. It was banned in India after a, after a initial run. So banned. Okay. Yeah. The second question that I have, and an observation, perhaps uh, you said, well, you know, in India, of course, it's known. You know, there's nothing new in this, and it's known. I would like you to uh, revisit this uh, this this observation of yours. Uh, is it really known? You know, I think that's why precisely after 100 years, we are still having a discussion on Siddhartha today. Is it really known? Was it really known? Not really. I don't think we, most of us know anything about the Vedanta. We don't know anything about Buddhism. Spirituality, in fact, is it's ousted out of the academic debates or anything. The term spirituality has really only recently made a foray, a re-entry into academic discourses. We, we did not know anything about it. We have been reading about Vedanta and we have a, some kind of a fuzzy, vague idea about what um, Vedanta is. But that is, again, as Jyoti rightly pointed out, that was a German Indology. The, the, the Vedantas, the Buddhism, it's really a kind of a funny amalgamation that we have been given, it has been imported to us via the West. That is very important, I think, you know, so I mean, this could be then the point where we can actually then start actually looking at the texts, at least, yeah, we, we don't know what it is actually. Uh, the so th another thing was, you know, I mean, if it had been, I, so now that was another thing. Guide was another movie that came. You said um, Chitra Lekha, Guide and RK Nayan, 1958. That was a novel and it was made by Devanand. I think that also kind of uh, talks about <clears throat> the, the, the development, about uh, this self-inquiry of the individual. Individuation is also very important there. So Raju Guide, who, is, who gets uh, who, uh, who falls in love with Baida Rahman, Rosie, and gets into an illicit love affair with her, wants to run away, uh, ends up he becoming go, corrupt. He set out to, to uh, achieve the spiritual... Uh, right, you know, and, and in the uh, end, yeah, in it, the it end... It happens to him, it happens exactly. to him, he doesn't seek it up. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, this, is, uh, this, this, this topic seems to be interesting there at that point, you know, it seems to be of relevance in the 1970s. Would you like to say something there, maybe? Uh, would you like to comment? Yeah. Dr. Kamikrini, you want me to talk? You, I, 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 I'm sorry, I can't see your name. I'm, I'm really sorry. Deepa, Deepa yeah, hi, yeah. please, please. Yeah. Um, I think uh, in the seven, by the 70s, uh, there was an interest in India in the West. Uh, the people had come to Rishikesh and there was this whole uh, flower palm movement. And, you know, the, India had become a kind of a flavor of the decade, so to say. So I think this film uh, became part of that uh, discovery of India kind of, situation that was happening at that point from the Westerners point of view. At that point, it wasn't even sure the film was even released in India because a lot of uh, films made abroad were not released here. Uh, but uh, and the book were also may not have been read by that many people till the film came and people started saying, oh, what is this? And they started reading the book. Um, I don't even think it's one of uh, Herman Hesse's best books, you know, I think it's the most simple of all the things and his, his own understanding of India, which, I mean, he had experience first and it wasn't as if he, he was a, a, a you know, shallow thinker or anything, but uh, it became part of the a Westerners Indian experience, I think. I don't know if Dr. Tilak could agree. I would surely agree because this is completely uh, the 70s film and what the people were expecting at that time. And uh, what we were having in our film industry at that time is uh, mostly what people would want to watch. But Siddhartha is completely, to some extent, I would say it's different from the films which were produced in 70s, what the viewers were getting to see. I think we are over time. Uh, should we wrap up? 
May I say something first? Yes, please. Can I? Can I? So, if yeah, I can. Yeah, five minutes over time, but please go ahead. Anyway, I think this back to this point, all this uh, the film, how it is made. I think the problem is the commercial film, basically. Uh, so, and then uh, the, that's only a genre. I mean, how these films were made in India, and then with uh, Shashi, Shashi Kabu is the most ideal face for that. You know, someone who acted in English plays, and then in Heat and Dust and all this is my merchant films. Uh, but I. I See, the point is, it's still a commercial film and, and it was known as Simi in Sitata, you know, pointing to that uh, nude scenes and uh, the sensuality that, that's portrayed. But then you add uh, flavors, like uh, the last one, that the typical Be Bengali film motif, like the song and somebody leaving uh, in a boat in the backwater. It's very Bengali, you find in many films, like both classical and the commer commercial film. And uh, uh, so uh, it's, 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 it's a genre and the language also. I think the main problem is the English. The language is the problem. With the English, it doesn't, doesn't suit to the theme. And I see the Spanish subtitles. I'm, I'm more comfortable with Spanish in that sense. Mm -hmm. I wonder how it would have been if it was in German. I, I don't know, because the novel is in German. In German. Yeah, so these are, these are the problems. So finally, that Bangla scene is the most... Uh, Soothing and shooting <laughs> in some way, yeah, for us, you no. Know? But anyway, it's made for a Western public, and and I didn't know that it was the photographer was Sven Nyquist. Mm. Nyquist. I mean, I'm so surprised. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good news. That's a great news. I'm, but I don't know why he was assigned. He could have had a Satyatrace photographer for that. You know, anyway. We could have, but like I said, it, it, in those days, it was not easy to make a film in India. So one doesn't even know what he went through. Right. To make you in India, you know. So that's it. So shall shall we wrap up? So the next session can start. Very, very, very interesting talk and uh, film clips and all. So, so nice to. Thank you, Katila. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, so with that we would conclude this session. Thank you, Sati Sati Shetin, uh, Dr. Shrikant Pathak, Dr. Gresha Tirak for your highly interesting and thought provoking presentations. Thank you, Professor Dengre and Deepa Gelot for, for your insights during the moderation.